Good morning, everyone. Today, we'll provide our weekly modeling update, and Dr. Levine will announce a new step in our contact tracing process, which will help get information more quickly to those who've been in close contact with a positive case. As he'll share, we won't be able to do this for every person, but it will definitely help with containment. Doing all we can collectively continues to be crucial because we're still seeing too many days with over 100 new cases. And our long-term care facilities are still being impacted, which unfortunately has led to more loss of life due to COVID. I know it's hard to be separated from friends and family, but we've got to pay attention to what's happening right before our eyes. That's why I'm once again urging Vermonters to follow our health guidance, like avoiding multi-family gatherings that are a want rather than a need. Think about the risks you may be imposing on your loved ones and everyone you come in contact with afterwards. As well, avoid travel. And if you do take that trip, you've got to quarantine, which means avoid contact with others for seven days and then get a test. And when you're around those outside your household, wear a mask, keep six feet apart, and wash your hands. These are the most important things we can do right now. So we can get a handle on the virus and keep it out of our nursing homes, away from our most vulnerable, and keep our schools open so kids can get the in-person instruction we know they need. I know many of you are waiting to hear when we might be able to roll back some of our most recent guidance and allow for more travel and gatherings. But as we said last week, it's still too early to know the impact of Thanksgiving and what trajectory these holiday events will put us on before we make a decision on whether to reduce or to add additional steps. We also have to be aware of our surroundings and what's going on in other states, which as you'll hear from Commissioner Pichek this morning, is troubling. Rhode Island, a three and a half hour drive from here, has the highest rate of daily cases in the country, surpassing the Midwest hotspots. New Hampshire just had a 7% positivity rate with over 1,000 cases. Maine hit its record with 427 and Massachusetts has had over 7,000 cases in the last two days. So even if our numbers improve, I remain concerned about how our neighbors may affect us. For now, while we continue to collect data over the next few days, I'm asking yet again for your patience and perseverance. As we continue to await the FDA emergency approval, and then roll out the vaccine, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But we're not there yet. And we still have difficult days and months ahead. And we have to be realistic. The vaccines will not provide instantaneous relief. It will be many months before we receive enough for everyone. But even with all the obstacles before us, I know we'll get through this. But we need to be vigilant. Yesterday, we marked the 79th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And as I said in a statement to mark the solemn date, we can learn the lessons and honor the legacy of the greatest generation. Their service and sacrifice after the attack was both historic and inspiring, and it galvanized us as a country. And that service, that collective sacrifice, is a powerful reminder that there is no greater force for the greater good than when we are united in a common cause. That's what we've all done here in Vermont since day one, but we've got to keep it up. We've, got, we've come too far to give up, and the consequences are far too great. If we can just stay focused, I have no doubt we'll get through this, and we'll do it together. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Kucha. Uh, thank you, Governor, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, last week, 
Uh, we spoke about our cautious optimism with COVID-19 metrics starting to move in the right direction. And whilst more time is still needed to evaluate our own trajectory and the full impact of Thanksgiving, we are looking with caution at the rise in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that are occurring around us in New England and the Northeast. During the first week of December, both the country and the region have seen rapid case growth. The U.S. recorded an additional one million cases during the first five days of December. And New England, and in New England, all of our states, as the governor mentioned, have broken various single-day records in the past week. Further, the risk here at home remains high with more active cases circulating in our communities than at any previous point during the pandemic. We must continue to remain vigilant to do everything we can to protect ourselves and to protect others. Looking at the reported cases over the past three weeks, we can see that increases have been happening both nationally, regionally, and in Vermont, with that growth increasing over the past week. And while case growth is a cause for concern, the greater concern is the movement we've seen recently in the positivity rates. While the nation's positivity rate increased modestly and Vermont's decreased slightly over the past three weeks, the positivity rate for the region increased by more than 50% and has recently risen above the 5% threshold recommended by the World Health Organization. A similarly alarming statistic is that over the past week, we've also seen uh, the U.S. death rate reach its highest point on a seven-day average, surpassing the terrible peak that we experienced this past spring. And when we look at where the case growth is occurring and where it's happened over the past 14 days, we can see that the nation's hotspots are unfortunately moving closer to the Northeast, and that impact is already being felt. For the 15th straight week in a row, regional cases have increased, but that rate of increase has also jumped significantly this week, with over 50% more cases being reported this week compared to last. Further, with over 140,000 case, cases reported this week, the total reported cases this week far surpasses the previous regional high setback in April. And as we reported last week, the case growth that started to slow over the past few weeks, that trend has reversed course, and we've seen the most significant percentage increase in cases in the region uh, since last spring. Looking at the regional heat map where the hot spots are in the region, fortunately, none are currently in Vermont nor in northern New England. However, we continue to see the numbers the numbers of these 10 highest counties continue to increase. So the spots that have significant cases continue to get hotter uh, over the past few weeks. Looking at Vermont specific numbers, this week we reported 718 cases compared to last week. This is our single largest weekly increase. And it also pushed us over the threshold of 5,000 reported cases in Vermont. As you can see, it took us about 88 days to reach our first 1,000 cases and about 139 days to reach our second 1,000 cases. But as the rate of growth has picked up, we have reached these thresholds more quickly uh, in the recent weeks and months, taking only 10 days to move from 4,000 cases to 5,000 cases. Again, as we mentioned, the active case counts here in Vermont are greater than at any other time during the pandemic. Again, this means that our communities continue to have an elevated risk of COVID-19 and that we all have an elevated risk of encountering someone who is infectious. Accordingly, we must continue to follow the guidance and be vigilant. We're showing a Vermont forecast for the first time in two weeks, but I still want to make a note of caution that we need more data from Thanksgiving to determine exactly what trajectory and trend we're on. This is the trend that the forecast would tell us that we're on, but again, things that are sort of extemporaneous to the uh, forecast need to be considered, like the holidays uh, and the impact that we're gonna see in the days and about a week ahead. Across Northern New England, uh, we've added uh, 392 cases in our K through 12 school systems, 185 of those being reported in New Hampshire, 177 of those being reported in Maine, and 30 of them here in Vermont. 
There were no new outbreaks since last week's report in Vermont's long-term care facilities. However, we did report a significant number of new cases in those facilities that did have an outbreak, adding 117 from our last report on Tuesday, bringing the total to 283. And when we look at the national data on this topic, we see worrying statistics regarding long-term care facilities generally. Residents of these facilities make up about 0.6% of the U.S. population, but they've made up about 6% of U.S. cases to date. And unfortunately, this is a foreseeable consequence uh, when you have elevated cases in a community, as we are seeing here in Vermont as well. And finally, just a brief note uh, regarding our flu vaccination data. Uh, we are currently at 72% of our goal of 325,000 Vermonters having received the flu vaccine for the upcoming or current flu season, 6% of where we were last year. Um, this is also good news considering that we continue to experience reporting delays from the cyber incident that occurred at U uh, UVMMC. Uh, so these numbers are very likely underreported and even likely significantly underreported. So there has been a big uptake in the flu vaccine this year, but serves as a good reminder for all Vermonters who haven't gotten one yet that there's still certainly time to do so. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. To, to add to the grim statistics, I believe if you calculate a national po percent positivity rate, it's 11.5 percent. For those who uh, watch our website every day and look at our daily counts, um, you've noted that our daily numbers continue to go up and down a bit. They were over 100 on Friday and Saturday to the 60 range on Sunday. and. Uh, Monday to reported 100 today. There are 28 people hospitalized with COVID currently, four in the ICU, zero on ventilators. We're now in the time period when cases that could be linked to Thanksgiving gatherings would start to show up. So far, we're not seeing a clear trend or pattern or abundant events but the overall daily reports of infections are still in a higher range than we are accustomed to. While many people closely watch these case counts, don't forget these numbers represent people, and people are connected to communities. That means each person who has COVID-19 often has an impact somewhere else. When that person goes to school or a workplace or a healthcare facility, it can have a ripple effect. It means people need to quarantine, school pods may have to switch to remote learning, businesses may be disrupted. That's what we tend to call a situation, as health teams need to do additional follow-up to help prevent any further transmission among people in that setting. We're currently investigating 144 situations and to give you an idea of what they comprise, in the K through 12 school setting, 27 situations. Child care, six. Health care facilities, 45. Work sites, 54. It's a list that gets added to every day. It's a lot of work for the teams at the health department. But importantly, it's a reminder of how we are all connected right now, how each action we take affects our fellow Vermonters, and how often when we choose to follow the guidance, we are really protecting this unseen number of people every single day. Because when we prevent cases, we prevent situations, and when we prevent situations, we often prevent outbreaks. Right now we are following 38 outbreaks and I'd like to give you, in my only slide today, a quick look at our outbreaks over time, from back here in March all the way to the current date. The details of the slide may not show up well, although really it's the colors I want to call your attention to that would really matter. So starting in the very earliest days of the pandemic, when we didn't even have 
abundant testing or PPE available, there was community spread fairly quickly and outbreaks were predominantly in long-term care facilities in blue and in a correctional facility in green. In late spring, the community outbreak of Burlington Winooski occurred in magenta. Getting to the present, since mid-October, in the lighter gray, you will note a new type of outbreak related to social gatherings and other events, like the Central Vermont ice team event. But look what happens as we move from October into November. We go from the light gray back into the blue color that we started with. As you'll note, we had record-breaking daily case counts at that time, and we see that this increase in daily case counts really was impacting our congregate settings, such as long-term care facilities. And as you can see, the high proportion of outbreaks related cases among these settings in that brighter blue color. This is yet another example of the impact our actions can have on others. Increased social gatherings in October, leading to increases in cases throughout the state and ultimately impacting our most vulnerable settings. I have a few topics I'd like to uh, jump to this morning. First one is going to be a new initiative that Secretary Smith previously announced. Later this week, the Health Department will be launching a new text notification system for certain people who've been identified as close contacts by someone who has COVID-19. This will help us get information out as quickly as possible so these close contacts can quarantine right away and access other important information on our website. Please know that the texts do not replace our expert contact tracing work. Everyone who's identified as a close contact will still get a phone call from a contact tracer. The phone numbers that we use to text people will be provided by the person who has COVID-19. Our contact tracing team will help determine who gets these texts based on the exact situation. But if you do get a text, please know it is a legitimate and important message from the Department of Health. For people who do get a text, they'll see two short messages from the number 86911. It will tell them that they may be a close contact, that they should expect a call from a contact tracer, that they should quarantine right away, and that they should visit our website for more information, healthvermont.gov slash close contact. Texts will be sent between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. We hope that by using this new communication tool, Vermonters can start preparing quickly to take steps to protect themselves and others around them. Thank you in advance for answering the call and helping slow the spread of COVID-19 in Vermont. Moving back to Commissioner Pichak's slides, you note that amongst eight long-term care facilities, there were 283 cases of COVID-19. You see from these numbers how susceptible these facilities are to rapid and extensive spread of virus, even with existing testing and restrictive visitation requirements. Last Friday, I spoke of the more aggressive testing policy that we were immediately launching to help identify cases as early as possible and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 in these settings. For the 37 most susceptible, higher acuity skilled nursing facilities, that consisted of daily staff testing with the Binax Now antigen test cards, along with weekly PCR testing for all staff. And for the lower acuity assisted living and residential care facilities, it used antigen tests for immediate identification in symptomatic staff or residents, and it was paired with twice weekly PCR testing. I'm pleased to update you and note that over the weekend, 60 already CLIA waivered facilities received a total of 42,400 cards, leaving 15,000 in reserve for additional supplies. 
This will permit testing all staff for the next 10 days, plus if needed, a round of resident testing. We're currently working with Health and Human Services in Washington to obtain more of our promised allotment. I'd like to also reconnect with comments I made previously regarding the treatment bam lenivimab once again. That is the monoclonal antibody. Two weeks ago, I noted that this drug, which had just received emergency use authorization from the FDA and was being shipped to states by the federal government, received unfavorable reviews from both the NIH and Infectious Disease Society of America. The NIH felt there was insufficient data to recommend for or against the use of this drug, which was thought indicated for preventing outpatients with mild to moderate COVID from needing hospitalization, and that it should only be used in a research trial. The Infectious Disease Society also suggested against routine use of the drug because of the low certainty of evidence at this time, though it left as an option use in a shared decision-making fashion, weighing the uncertain benefits and the risk for un, uh, untoward adverse events. Many interpreted my comments as closing the door on the use of this drug in Vermont, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, one of our smaller hospitals has already infused this drug into outpatients, and a number <clears throat> have requested and received allotments of doses. At a time when we're seeing case numbers and hospital numbers higher than ever before, we should avail ourselves of all options so long as there is transparency and a clear sh shared decision-making process between patients and their physicians, especially in light of the reports I cited. Furthermore, I do hope our experience in Vermont turns out favorable as we add to the nation's experience with this potentially promising new modality. My final comments will be an update on the tool in our toolbox we've been most waiting for, the COVID vaccines. <clears throat> we've been keeping in close communication with CDC and FDA as planning for vaccine distribution at the national and state levels has increased and evolved. The news about vaccines have been front and center and expectations are high. So I want one thing to be clear from the start. We're in the very first stages of vaccine production and distribution to the states. There will likely be a limited early supply of vaccine, so some groups may be recommended to get vaccination first. This is similar to when testing supplies were limited early in the pandemic. And recall today, we have more than enough of those. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met on December 1. They advised the CDC and voted to recommend that vaccine recipients in Phase 1A be high-risk health care workers and residents and staff of long-term care facilities. This was not a tremendous surprise. And on Friday, December 4th, Vermont's own advisory committee met to approve recommendations to further resign, refine those groups of vaccine recipients in phase 1A, based on the anticipated limited allocation to Vermont. Our implementation advisory group is in agreement with all of these groups, long-term care facility residents and staff with patient contact clinical and support staff who have patient contact in settings at high risk for COVID-19 patient contact, home health care clinical staff and caregivers at high risk, other health care providers staff who have patient contact. We will publish that information in an updated interim draft jurisdictional plan on the COVID vaccine page of our website. ASIP, the Advisory Committee nationally, will be making recommendations to the CDC for Phase 1B soon, and we will await those recommendations before making further plans. Vermont expects to receive the first shipment in mid-December, about a week from today. As always, this timeline is not promised and could shift, but I'm optimistic. So far, we've ordered 5850 doses, 5,850, and we will continue to place orders each week. 
Those doses take into account the fact that an equivalent number of doses are being held in reserve so that those individuals can get their second shot. Pharmacies that have been contracted to provide COVID-19 vaccine at skilled nursing facilities will receive a portion of these initial doses and may hold their earliest vaccination clinics at long-term care facilities as soon as December 21st. Despite the speed at which vaccines are being researched and developed, safety and efficacy remain the top priorities with respect to any COVID-19 vaccine. Before vaccinations can be given to the public, they must be approved by the FDA and formally recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. <clears throat> One last point, 2020 has been a lesson on what happens when we don't have a vaccine for an infectious disease. We're fortunate that the opposite is true for other diseases like flu, polio, measles. That's why we urge everyone who can to get vaccinated when the vaccine is available. And cost should not be a barrier. The COVID vaccine will be provided to Vermonters at no cost. While providers may charge an administrative fee, you are guaranteed COVID-19 vaccine regardless of whether you have insurance or your ability to pay the fees. Included in the guidance given to providers who will be the information that they may seek reimbursement from health insurance plans that cover COVID-19 vaccine administration fees. For uninsured patients, the vaccine provider can seek reimbursement for an administrative fee from the HRSA Provider Relief Fund. You're doing your part, and we will do ours. Turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. We'll start in the room with Calvin. Um, thank you, Governor. So uh, looking at the data today, you said that it's too soon to see the full impact of, of Thanksgiving and, and other holiday festivities. Um, and you said that, you know, we have to wait a few more days to see if we roll back some steps or take more steps, I think you said. Um, if the data continues to trend down uh, for the worst, what, what could we be looking at for more restrictions? If it continues downward or, uh, or upward? Worse, excuse me, like oh, yeah. cases. If it goes, yeah, I look at the other way around. Sorry. But, uh, yeah, if, it, uh, if we see more positive cases, uh, we're just going to have to reflect on what we can do uh, to protect ourselves, protect Vermonters. Uh, and we have a team working on that. Again, we meet almost uh, every day uh, to contemplate this, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. What we're seeing right now is uh, at least a, a leveling out. Uh, it's still not good news. Uh, the triple digit uh, every single day isn't good news, but we did see uh, a day when we had, I think, in the 60s. Um, and so if we see uh, that trend continue, then it doesn't appear that we'd have to take any measures at all. Uh, that we can continue down this path. We, we really want to get beyond Christmas and New Year's. Uh, that Those are the two big, big ones from my uh, standpoint, and get into January. Uh, and then with the vaccine coming into play, and uh, again, less activity, I believe uh, that uh, then we'll be on a, a more of a downhill a slide, uh, so to speak. So I'm, um, I'm looking forward to that, uh, but we have to stay vigilant over the next uh, probably month uh, in order to get to that other side of the uh, of the most infectious period. And as you probably saw over the weekend, um, a new stimulus package from Congress remains elusive. Um, you know, we've been hearing for months really about you know, a lot of critical programs, PUA, um, you know, housing programs, uh, the Everyone Eats program, for instance. I'm just wondering how, how the state Maybe just looking at everyone each, for example, the one that provides uh, meals to, from, from restaurants to families in need. Um, how are we preparing, I guess, first off, for the need for, for additional food resources? Yeah, we'll continue uh, here in Vermont. Uh, we've been uh, providing the foundation to, for us to continue uh, for a bit. Uh, the unemployment uh, insurance is my biggest worry at this point, and, uh, and as well, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged at the same time uh, seeing this bipartisan effort in the in the Senate, uh, in the House. At least they're talking at this point. I uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with Senator Leahy 
yesterday. And, um, and so I'm cautiously optimistic. I know they're working very hard. Our congressional delegation is, is trying to do what it can uh, to move this forward. And uh, myself and four other Republican governors uh, wrote a letter uh, to our uh, to our uh, senators, the majority in the uh, in the Senate in particular, um, to tell them that we we as Republicans uh, are concerned. We need uh, their support. We need um, their help in uh, providing for relief uh, for our constituents. So um, we're hopeful, and uh, and I again I'm cautiously optimistic that something will will be able to be agreed upon uh, over the next. Uh, uh, Couple of weeks. It may not be uh, today, this week, uh, but I'm. They're working at it. Uh, I know Congressman Welch. Uh, we uh, we text as well, and I know that he's uh, supportive of our efforts, and uh, he's trying to to get a deal moving uh, through the House and through the Senate. Thank you. Liz, MBC Five. Um, with the vaccine coming out next week, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the freezers that are going to be needed to store the vaccine at very cold temperatures. How many freezers does the state currently have, and where exactly are they located? Yeah, we're in pretty good shape in that respect, um, and it, it's due to proper planning on the on the uh, uh, behalf of the SEOC, the public safety, and so forth. I might ask uh, Commissioner Sherling. Uh, he's on top of this. I know we had ordered freezers. And I'm not sure if the, the, the last one came in or not, but uh, Mr. Sherling, can you bring us up to date on this? I can. Uh, I couldn't hear the entire question. Um, Governor, I think it's somebody who's in the room with a full distance from the microphone. Um, but if it's, if the question appears to be regarding the status of our freezer capability. Yes. Uh, and we do have Okay, we do have the uh, freezer space that's been uh, deployed at the, the vaccine depot, and there are a number of possible facilities around Vermont that also have uh, the freezer capacity uh, to be able to handle the ultra cold Pfizer vaccine. So we believe we're in uh, we're in good shape to receive um, both initial doses and then hopefully as the numbers ramp up to be able to accommodate those as well. I, I will add, and uh, Dr. Levine maybe could speak to this further, but. The Moderna vaccine isn't as low a temperature, doesn't require uh, that to be stored at a low temperature like the Pfizer vaccine. And we're hearing that uh, there are other vaccines coming uh, coming out possibly uh, that could be uh, stored at room temperature. So uh, again, we think, we believe we're in good shape because of the freezer capacity we have here uh, that would accommodate the Pfizer vaccine. And again, uh, we don't have that concern with Moderna and certainly some of the others that are coming about. Dr. Levine, anything? I think that's good. Okay, so it sounds like they're at the freezer capacity. It's at a number of hospitals, any state facilities? Yes. Uh, okay. We had uh, purchased a, a, uh, um, I, I think, a low temperature freezer uh, for our vaccine storage facility, a state, a state run. Is that correct, uh, Commissioner Shirley? It is, Governor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, again, uh, on the expiration of the uh, uh, unemployment, uh, I've taken in several calls from folks who are in the system. They did, uh, they did appreciate the news that once they're in, they're in, you know, they're, they're still in the system even though the program goes away. But they're saying they're at the point now where by the end of the year they may be homeless. Yeah. I Again, I, I don't uh, underestimate um, what uh, they're going through, um, and, uh, and I have an extreme amount of sympathy, and we're working very hard, diligently, uh, but it really is up to Congress at this point. Uh, we just don't have the means, the capacity, or the, or, or the, the use of the uh, Unemployment Trust Fund uh, to be able to continue. It just, we just can't do it. Uh, we need their authorization. So um, we're hopeful. Uh, and I think they get that part. That's why I believe there'll be some sort of compromise. There'll be something uh, that will come into play. Uh, from again, from my standpoint, I would like to, to see more stimulus dollars and and other uh, money for um, all of uh, what we need to do. Um, but that one action, they could take a, a couple of steps and uh, be able to to uh, to um, I guess uh, give us uh, the ability 
uh, to continue with the uh, unemployment benefits. Is there anything that uh, folks can do that you can see to maybe put some pressure on these folks to get yeah, going? I mean, we're, again, we're doing all we can um, uh, in the state, um, writing uh, to to your uh, uh, Congress, uh, um, whether it's uh, Secretary or uh, Senator Leahy or uh, Senator Sanders or Congressman Welch. I will say they're on board, um, but yeah. it doesn't hurt uh, to reinforce that. Um, but they, uh, they again, uh, see the need as well. Thank you. Moving to the phones, we'll start with Ed at the Newport Daily Express. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Took a moment. All right. Question uh, for the governor and as well to Dr. Levine. Yeah, I want to understand I have a dog in a fight, but I have been getting feedback from the uh, issue involving Iris Bird and, uh, and the, uh, at the church where a person was with the COVID virus and came out negative three times, um, swore that she wasn't at church on that Sunday service and all of that, and the accusations that have come through that you don't believe it, that she and the congregation and the preacher tell the truth. Can, can you give us an update on what you think the truth of the matter is? Uh, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Ed. I, I really have no update, nothing more to add to what I said at the press conference on Friday, um, that according to our staff and our laboratory test results, uh, we have a positive. Nothing more I can really say. Well, I understand that. I appreciate it. Uh, are, are you, uh, have you been able to do follow-up? You know, um, particularly with the contacting and all that, has that, uh, have you been able to do that? You know, that's already well over a week or more old already, so I don't know of anything recently that's happened other than what always occurs initially. So um, I've, I've really no update on that as well. The, the contact tracing that would have been relevant would have occurred at the time, and if we got input after our uh, press release was released uh, telling others that they may have been exposed. Um, but I'm not aware of anything in this recent few days that's happened uh, that's different. Meaning uh, there's been no uh, positive cases other than that one uh, from the people who are at the church? I can't say that with certainty. Um, that I'd have to look into. I would hope there haven't been, to be honest. Right, I, right, I understand that. right now, if you are a close contact of a case of COVID in Vermont, you have an 18% chance of becoming a case yourself. Looking at that flip side, over an 80% chance you will not become a case. But I, I bring that up because earlier in the pandemic, you had less than a one in 10 chance of becoming a case. Now it's almost the one in five. Thank you, appreciate that uh, answer. I, I just would also like to add, um, we're seeing more cases in Orleans County than we'd like to see. Um, so for those who are listening, if you are going out, uh, please wear, wear a mask. It's a simple thing to do. And uh, it might prevent someone from uh, from you uh, coming in contact with someone, you becoming infected, or you infecting someone else. So it's a it really is a just an easy method to prevent the spread. Hey, thank you, Governor. Wilson, the Associated Press. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I guess for Dr. Levine or whoever would like to answer it. Over the summer, or 
after the initial surge of, of cases in the spring that were in the congregate care facilities, the numbers went down, I'm looking at the chart, pretty much to zero through and out the summer. How did they get back in? Um, what, what was the mechanism of that? And uh, one to ten, it's easy to understand how it could get take off up so quickly, but how was it so positive for such a long time and then suddenly, within a couple of weeks, it explodes as it appears to have? Yeah, thank you. Some of it came in through a little softly, so I just want to make sure you're referring to cases overall in the state or in long-term care facilities? No, specifically in the long-term care facilities. Okay. So, you know, I, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but at every place in society that we go, uh, we go as a representative of the community that we come from. And whether we're going to a work site at a long-term care or whether we're going to school or what have you, um, we, we look like our community So, uh, with regard to virus. So the reality is spring and summer, we had such a success due to all of the work of Vermonters and all of their compliance in the spring uh, with everything that we asked of them. Uh, that we got the level of virus suppressed to a very, very low place. And frankly, we've enjoyed that for months and months and months and months until we got into this mid-October to November uh, cycle here. Um, so our communities now have more virus in them. So people can vector this virus into a facility bring it in without knowing it because they don't feel poorly. They're in the several days of having no symptoms or they may actually have no symptoms um, during the time course of their illness. And so they're not aware of it when they enter the facility. I think that's what happens and all it takes is one case in places where you have a vulnerable group of people and it can take off. So that's sort of the simple explanation. Okay, great, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, it appears the uh, Vermont Police Academy has become the uh, first uh, Vermont school that has had in-person spread of COVID virus. An update this morning indicates there's now a third of the students tested positive. Uh, What's the latest you've heard on the police academy outbreak and how will that impact future training for police? Uh, and obviously it's gonna delay state troopers, sheriffs, municipal getting out on the road uh, when we are already facing some shortages in the police world. Yeah, it may, it may be twofold. I don't know if uh, Dr. Levine wants to or, or Commissioner Sherling first. Uh, maybe Commissioner Sherling could uh, bring us up to, to speed as to uh, where we're at um, in the, at the police academy. Certainly, uh, thanks for the question, Mike. Um, much earlier in the year when the prior class was uh, in session, the uh, academy staff in close contact with the, the entire public safety community made alterations to the operational posture to try to prevent this from happening uh, by cohorting the class, reducing the size, uh, and a, a number of other efforts. Unfortunately, uh, those efforts uh, did not work this past week, as you've indicated. Uh, as of now, eight of 23 students have uh, gotten a, a rapid test that indicates a positive, but they are also symptomatic, so they're uh, implied positives at this point. We also have one symptomatic staff member that's down there who is uh, pending a test. We anticipate that. Uh, everyone, uh, both students, faculty, and staff uh, who were present last week uh, will be tested on Friday using the PCR platform to confirm and determine the full scope of infection for those who may be asymptomatic. Uh, until then, the academy is closed. Uh, all of the folks I mentioned uh, are, uh, are isolated or quarantined, and um, the academy staff is uh, assessing uh, based on those will assess based on uh, those results um, what the operational posture looks like going forward. I know that they have been able to uh, pivot to online uh, learning for a variety of the things that the, the uh, 
um, students are working on this week. Unfortunately, it's not a uh, not a curriculum that lends itself to being entirely online. Um, so more work to be done uh, in that arena. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. Yes, was, was there something particular you wanted me to add to that uh, very comprehensive view? No, I, I, it's just the governor thought the two of you might have something to say, if, if not. Uh, my other uh, question, uh, uh, maybe to the governor or to Commissioner Sterling, now that Attorney General Donovan has publicly ruled the temporary gag order imposed by public safety, Three months ago was invalid or inappropriate. Will TPS issue a new written order restoring transparency within the state police uh, promptly and revoking the old gag order? And secondly, when will Vermonters be able to expect the release of the public information on cases that the state police had to hide without crime these past 12 weeks while the legal opinion was sought from uh, Attorney General? Donovan. Yeah, Mike, um, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Sherling to, to comment as well. Um, this is somewhat breaking news to me. I uh, actually just saw the headline of your article uh, in the Times Argus and the, uh, maybe the Bennington Banner, um, but, um, but I didn't read the article yet. So we weren't, um, I wasn't notified uh, from the Attorney General. I don't believe we were, uh, but, um, but at this point, uh, it's good news in some respects. We had offered uh, the assistant AGs had, had uh, questioned whether the legality. Uh, so we asked the AG uh, to weigh in and, and he has at this point. So this is good news. Now we can move in that direction and probably reinstitute what we were doing before uh, with the AG's blessing. So Commissioner Sherling, anything to offer? Well, there seems to, uh, seem to be a breakdown down in communication uh, uh, Attorney General Donovan said he, that Rosemary Grakowski, the legal counsel for DPS, had been told some time ago, and uh, when told that you guys didn't know anything about it as of last Friday, he said he planned to call Commissioner Sterling directly. So that oh, okay. Well, maybe maybe he did. Fine, I'll let uh, Commissioner Sterling answer whether uh, the Attorney yeah, General called him. Thanks, Governor. Um, Mike, my, my uh, answer is going to probably be far less satisfying than what you're looking for. Um, but first, I need to flag an error that uh, no opinion had been communicated to us until this morning when the Attorney General and I spoke for the first time. Uh, he and I are very clear on that. Um, our staffs have been in contact uh, for a number of weeks, but no opinion had been communicated until this morning. Of note, the opinion that we discussed this morning is very narrow. Uh, it relates to accident reports specifically. So I want to flag for transparency and in the interest of clarity that we're continuing to evaluate a variety of conflicting statutory constructs that deal with juvenile records across the 40 volumes of, uh, of statutes that exist uh, here in Vermont. Um, on the 23rd of October, uh, DPS legal staff had forwarded a memo to the AG's office for review. We're not asking them to define our policy, only to cross-check the legal analysis. And this morning, as I've indicated, uh, the AG and I spoke for some time. Um, we're both quite clear that there continues to be um, confusion uh, as a result of conflicting statutes that are not intentional. It just happens organically when uh, laws evolve over time. Um, we have uh, that, as I mentioned, an, an ongoing analysis underway around the full spectrum of records relating to juveniles. And again, in the interest of transparency, it's not only juveniles, it's those under the jurisdiction of the family court, which the legislature has recently expanded to be uh, people that are all the way up to age 22. So um, we both believe that this is something that could use uh, some legislative clarification. We plan to ask the legislature to take a look and determine whether they, they want to wade into this beginning in January. Uh, regarding the analysis of accident reports and juveniles, uh, for clarity for all those who are listening, uh, we've never wavered that accident reports are a public record at some point. The question is, and the thing that we've been analyzing, is when they become a public record. 
while an investigation is pending, there is a subsection of public records law that uh, prevents them from um, from becoming public. If no charges occur, and again, that relates to juvenile, uh, if no charges occur, then those accident reports can be released. And at uh, every time the accident report reaches the Department of Motor Vehicles, another statutory construct takes over, and they're always able to be released from that particular repository. In the event that charges result against the juvenile as a result of an accident report, uh, or charges that um, were to occur as a result of uh, someone that's subject to the family court's jurisdiction, so it could be an 18, 19, 20-year-old, uh, if those charges are referred to the family court, there's a section of the juvenile law that prevents the law enforcement agency from doing any kind of publicity that relates to that report. But again, there's a conflicting statute where that report then becomes public when it reaches the Department of Motor Vehicles. So we're well aware of the, the strangeness of all of that, um, but our job as, uh, as law enforcement is to make sure we're following the law to the greatest extent possible. Um, I just would also note that every time the question gets asked, it's referred to as a gag order. It's simply an, offer, a, a, an effort at making sure we're complying with the letter of the law, which is our primary responsibility as a law enforcement agency. Well, the, the traffic tickets, so you haven't addressed the traffic tickets, even though that was clearly part of that whole problem? This morning, all we talked about were uh, accident reports. As I indicated, we've got an array of other um, analysis that is underway. And again, we're hopeful that maybe there'll be some uh, some clarity that could be brought this through um, uh, a legislative look as well. OK, well, maybe you can call me later and elaborate uh, a little bit more. Thanks. Thanks very much. Pat, WCAS. Hi, so I had a question from a viewer about cases in long-term care facilities. They wanted to know why are these cases and deaths occurring and then spreading in healthcare facilities if the staff and residents are both following PPE requirements and other state requirements that are designed to prevent spread? Like, basically, I think they want to know where is the breakdown that's allowing the infection to spread once it, you know, a staff member maybe brings it in and doesn't know they have it. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Kat. That's an important one. Um, you know, we learned a lot of important lessons from the early part of the pandemic with long-term care facilities and did very well with them for so many months until, as I've said before, the level of community, uh, vi community level of virus increased. Um, these facilities do have, you know, obviously access to and use of PPE. Um, but they do suffer from some common things together. Number one is um, their patients don't all have private rooms. In fact, the minority would have a private room. Uh, another item is that the facilities often have so many patients in them, not that they're overcrowded, but just uh, to their capacity, that when it comes to cohorting patients and trying to isolate people out quickly early on when you're identifying cases, that becomes very challenging for them. I think another issue is they're always vulnerable to staffing issues. And the minute staff begin to get COVID um, and other staff that they've been connected with have to quarantine, uh, they quickly run into staffing issues, making it challenging for them to cohort both patients and staff at the same time uh, in separate places. And sometimes it's just the geographic arrangement of the facilities. Some of the ones that have patients separated by floors um, are able to contain outbreaks one floor and not another floor versus those that are more uh, on one level and horizontally integrated where there's less of a division between one setting and another. Our healthcare outbreak prevention team has done just yeoman's work working with all these facilities, both in a preventive and preemptive strategy, as well as in a uh, outbreak response strategy. Um, and uh, because we think it's so important, they're actually meeting this week with members of the CDC um, who uh, have guided us at previous junctures throughout the pandemic 
uh, just to see if there's something else that we're not doing that we can do more effectively or have these facilities uh, do more effectively. Uh, so that's sort of where the status is right now. But I think, again, it's that ability of the virus to come into the facility unbeknownst to anyone because they have no symptoms and maybe even multiple people at a time and then through some of the other staff or even the residents not having symptoms but having virus when you don't know it. That's why we do these very rapid facility-wide testings of these uh, places, residents and staff. But often once we've done that, uh, things have already happened. So we're discovering uh, some of the transmission as it's occurring real time. And I think that's the nature of what happens in these closed congregate facilities. I, I do want to point out, we have a lot of cases on the slide we showed today, and those were eight facilities, uh, not all of which are at the level of the skilled nursing facilities. Um, we have a 37 total in the state, and over 200 of the aggregate types of uh, long-term care facilities, and this is not impacting every single one of them. So the ones that are impacted, it's very unfortunate, and we feel terrible about the necessary illnesses, hospitalizations, and sometimes loss of life. But don't get the impression it's uh, impacting every facility in the state, because it certainly is not. And so then it's not a question of, like, do we need to have better types of PPE for them so that the virus, if they have it, doesn't get spread in the first place? Um, it's just a matter of these things kind of just happen? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm thinking, like, is there a better mask or something that could be used or something like right. that? Right. I don't think it's the type or the access to PPE that's the issue as much as it does happen. Sometimes that might imply that there's been a breakdown in, uh, in protocol, uh, but that's been very hard to identify when it comes to uh, any of these facilities. Um, and you're, you're often identifying something that may have happened two, three, four days prior. Um, and you really can't trace it to a specific person or a specific protocol or um, anything like that. Got it. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. There's a very visible increase in testing availability in our community and other parts of central Vermont, including drive up testing with no need to register or make an appointment. Are these testing opportunities for asymptomatic people who are following the state guidelines? Or are they for asymptomatic and symptomatic people who socialize with another household or feel they may have been exposed? I guess I'm wondering, is there enough testing capacity today who wants to can get regularly tested? Or should these new testing opportunities be reserved for symptomatic people or those who are worried about exposure? Yeah, Lisa, I'll let Dr. Levine answer uh, more completely, but from, from our standpoint, our goal is uh, to have testing available to anyone who wants it. And, uh, and whether they're uh, asymptomatic, uh, obviously if they're symptomatic, we'd rather not have them go to those testing platforms. Uh, but we just want it available for anyone who has questions, where they've been, or who they've been with, uh, to have an opportunity to, to get tested so they know where they are at least that day. So um, that's our goal. And uh, we've, uh, we've increased the testing capacity dramatically, as you noted. Uh, throughout the state and uh, we continue to try and build upon that uh, so that we can get our case count back down uh, to where it was at one point uh, during the summer. Dr. Levine. Yeah, very, very comprehensive answer. And the only thing I'll add is um, the word asymptomatic is important. Most of these are designed for that. Those who do have symptoms work usually through their healthcare system and their healthcare providers. But um, if you've been to gatherings, clearly that's a priority. If you're a person who just is more uh, social and tends to uh, end up in gatherings of people periodically, we're actually recommending that clinicians direct those individuals to get weekly testing. Because again, we're trying to get at the people who have virus but don't have any symptoms, may develop symptoms, but are infectious without symptoms because that's really the uh, power that this virus has over us um, in this country and in this world. 
uh, and that's how it can infect people so frequently. Uh, so the more we can get a handle on that, uh, the better. And if you are testing yourself without symptoms, you are doing everyone else a lot of good, especially if you've been in gatherings, but even if you haven't, if you have other reasons for the testing, like you may have been in contact with someone with COVID, or you may have uh, performed some travel and need to uh, and would like to test to get out of quarantine, those are fine reasons. But you're protecting somebody else when you get tested because if you have a positive test uh, that allows others to know that they may also, may also have come in contact with you and be potentially infectious so they can isolate themselves out as well. Okay, thank you very much. Craig, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, just for clarity's sake on that last question, uh, you mentioned that you wanted everybody to be able to get a test that, that wanted one. Uh, but I did notice that starting next week, there's no testing center in Franklin County anymore. And, and last I looked, Franklin County is like fourth or fifth of the the county's impacted right now. What's up with the decision on that? Yeah, I, I find that hard to, to believe. I'm not doubting you, but I would think we would have more testing facilities there, and I believe we do. Um, maybe Secretary Smith, uh, can you can you shed some light on this, Franklin County? Yeah, sure, Governor. We we do have um, 18 testing centers up uh, around the state that are seven days a week in most cases seven days a week we are uh, you have testing capability at northwestern we are going to be including additional testing in either next week or the week after in franklin county i think there are two spots scheduled for uh for franklin county one being in richford the other one escapes me where it is right now but uh, I can get that information for you, Greg, and uh, those will be coming up either next week or I think it's next week, Greg. I, I would appreciate that. Uh, are these testing centers that you can sign up for on the state website? I don't yeah. Think there's one that you can, you can sign up for on the state website. I think you have to go through a provider for that. Yeah, these are ones you can do. These are the uh, on-demand testing sites that we're putting in to Franklin County. Okay, appreciate that clarification. Uh, Governor, you've mentioned in the past that there's little to no evidence that there's been spread in restaurants in Vermont. Um, I, I've been to two restaurants in, in the last handful of days, one in St. Albans, where there were no other customers the, the two hours I was there. Um, Dairy Center here in Enosburg, uh, Sunday morning where you would expect that they would have to be taking uh, reservations very quiet here on Saturday. Uh, what kind of reassurance can you give Vermonters to help encourage them to patronize their their favorite establishments to keep them going? Uh, and, and kind of the second part of that, as your administration excuse me, works to uh, prepare to present a budget to the legislature next month, are you looking to do any programs that are gonna gonna help keep Vermont's hospitality industry afloat. Yeah, um, I'll take this last part first. Um, as you know, uh, over the past nine months since we've been trying to allot the um, the stimulus money to different sectors, we've highlighted the extreme um, position that the uh, hospitality industry is under, uh, restaurants and lodging in particular. Uh, that's why uh, we committed uh, the, the $150 million uh, in, in uh, stimulus money uh, that's going out the door uh, as we speak uh, a lot over the ne next uh, couple of weeks. And we specifically wanted to, to highlight uh, the hospitality industry uh, again in particular because we know they're under extreme uh, duress. And uh, in terms of the, the behavior, you know, people, um, and right, rightfully so, um, are a, a bit timid in terms of getting out, which, which we, again, encourage uh, that uh, you be aware of your surroundings, of what you're getting yourself into. 
uh, but we put into place uh, guidelines for restaurants uh, that, uh, that are fairly strict. 50% um, occupancy rate, uh, one household uh, per table, uh, wearing a mask when you go in, uh, taking names, uh, making reservations, so forth and so on. So I, uh, I acknowledge uh, it's difficult, uh, but, uh, but in these times, under these circumstances, it needs to be. And uh, hopefully, uh, when again we get uh, to the other side, uh, we get to pass uh, pass the uh, the holiday season uh, and get into January, uh, that we'll see the case counts uh, continue to go down. The vaccines will be in place, and and we'll be able to distribute, start to distribute those, uh, and we'll get back to some sort of normalcy over time. Uh, but uh, but we've done. We'll continue uh, to uh, to focus on the hospitality sector. With this next round, hopefully there's going to be a next round, and I, I'm fairly confident there will be, uh, if not in the next couple of weeks, uh, certainly uh, in January or February, but, but I, I believe that there will be a package that comes out of, out of Congress uh, that will help, and we will continue to do everything we can uh, to help uh, individuals, uh, our Vermonters, and, and uh, those who are unemployed at this point in time, as well as the businesses that are so uh, that are in dire straits. Uh, some of them are right on the edge. We've known that all along. We continue to know that. And uh, we continue to do all we can uh, to, to make sure that we keep them uh, in survival mode so that uh, when we come out of this, uh, they'll be able to thrive. So we haven't taken our focus off from them. Uh, quite the opposite. We're, we're doing everything we can to, to put, uh, um, put resources uh, towards uh, those initiatives. So, in short, you're pretty confident with the uh, restrictions that you have that restaurants are safe to, to eat at and, and patronize? Yeah, if, they're, if you're following the guidelines, we've found uh, very little evidence that there is spread within restaurants under the guidance that we have in place. Knowing that it's strict, uh, we believe it's safe. Have, have you been to any restaurants personally since the pandemic began? I don't get out much, uh, Greg. Uh, this uh, this pandemic has uh, consumed my life um, from from before uh, before light to well after light, and uh, it's been six seven days a week. I do take advantage every now and then of uh, of takeout, um, but uh, but but again, it's from my standpoint. I just don't have uh, the opportunity, the time to do this. All right, we're going to move to. Okay. It would just seem like, you know, if, if it's completely safe that you'd at least hear that the governor has gone out and, and patronized some of these businesses. On yeah, it's, not, it's not for lack of, of confidence, Greg. It's, it's for lack of opportunity and time. I, I think you can imagine uh, how much work uh, is going on uh, in, in front, you know, in front of everyone on the, uh, involved in the press conference today, but also behind the scenes. It's just constant so uh, i just don't have the opportunity uh, to go Greg, we got to move that's six questions for us. so we're going to move to andrea from seven days thank you hi there um i am i'm wondering um i know that uh healthcare workers and and the residents and staff of long-term care facilities are are um sort of in this 1a group for the vaccine distribution um, but it looks like um, long-term care facility residents and workers alone would be about two-thirds of those initial shipments that we are expected to get. I'm wondering how that, um, uh, what, what the plan is for sort of allocating um, kind of those shipments proportionally as they come in. Yeah. Um, let, kind of who will sure. get those. I'll let Dr. Levine answer that, but <clears throat> keep in mind, uh, we'll get an initial shipment, and then we're supposed to be uh, continuing uh, to receive shipments on a weekly basis. So we may not get to some people the first week, the second week, the third week, uh, but we are uh, do whatever we can uh, to continue the process. Dr. Levine? Yeah, so we don't have the exact allocation numbers uh, of the 58-50 doses, uh, but portion will go to each of those groups that you mentioned, knowing that uh, over the 
three weeks to four weeks uh, that follow that, the same number of doses will come in and uh, be apportioned appropriately as well. We also don't know yet what the uptake of those will be. I suspect in long-term care, the uptake will be very high. Uh, the healthcare workforce, our hospitals have been formally and informally surveying their workforce. And I would say two months ago, it was a 50-50 split. More recently, it's in the 70 to over 80% range of people who said that when the vaccine arrived, they would uh, uh, have that administered to themselves. So those are the kinds of uncertainties we deal with, but I'm really heartened by the fact that so many more are saying they would actually take the vaccine. And I suspect that when this is, uh, as we expect it to be, uh, given authorization, which could happen by the end of this week, uh, people will have even more confidence after they get to see the data and uh, understand the review process this went through. Um, and, and so uh, kind of as, as far as that, that um, initial, sort of initial um, breakdown, do you expect that that would look something like 50-50 to sort of um, Yes. Uh, long term long term care versus healthcare workers would that sort of depend on on who's asking for it no no it's not who's asking for it so it is approximately 50 50 i don't have the exact numbers in front of me uh i okay. think the, the fact of the matter is uh we do want to protect people who are currently susceptible to infection hospitalization and dying in those facilities so we're clearly trying to prioritize that group uh, and working with the pharmacies that are going to be administering those doses. So uh, it's, it's, it's at least 50% of the dosing going there. Okay, great, thank you. Stuart, NBC5. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, question, I guess, for Dr. Levine. Uh, so we hear that the Pfizer vaccine is 94% effective with two doses, but we also hear that it is 80% effective after one, which would obviously double the number of people who could be vaccinated early on. Is it, is it two or nothing? Do you have uh, discretion or an opinion on this? Yeah. The answer is I don't have discretion, uh, nor should my opinion weigh in, um, because we're actually using the recommendations of uh, expert guidance panels and uh, the manufacturer themselves and the study results that you've pointed out some of the preliminary data that has become available. Um, the goal is really to have people uh, feel confident that they've received the best opportunity to have an immune response that's robust. So uh, there's no measurement being done of people after the first dose, after the second dose, to see what impact it had. And uh, I wouldn't want people to sort of play around with it in a sense. Uh, I'd rather we do it just the way we do other vaccines, knowing that we're trying to achieve that 95 and hopefully higher percent efficacy Ooh. Uh, and make sure everyone has an equal chance to do it. Um, then in fact, getting back to the word discretion, uh, even if I did have discretion, the government has taken that away from me because they're only releasing the doses for the first dose and holding back for the days that will elapse till the next dose is required and then shipping that in. Um, so they're kind of telling us right off the top of the bat, don't use your discretion. Give everyone who should have it their first dose at this time and make sure that they come back for the second dose uh, because that's when we're sending you the rest of it. Is it fair, Dr. Levine, to say that given the current uh, degree of spread that you want Vermonters to avoid all social gathering outside their own households, at least through the rest of the holiday season? Uh, right now, that's what we're saying, uh, but we're reserving judgment because, again, 
Um, not only do we say we want to be data driven, we want to be data driven. Um, and the data isn't complete yet. So I wouldn't want to tell people uh, dogmatically we made the decision weeks ago that uh, for the next five months you're not going to social gatherings. That's not true. Uh, we're really looking at it on a daily basis. So uh, I can't be more emphatic than that, that we will re-examine the data and come to new decisions. But obviously, if we stay where we are right now, um, we're going to probably not alter our stance. All right, thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Governor, you mentioned concerns specifically about Orleans County a little bit earlier. And I see uh, today's data uh, reports Orleans with its with the county's biggest increase in cases yet. Um, I know often there isn't enough information to comment on sourcing for current day cases, but are there any indicators of outbreaks or clusters there? Um, and will the state take any additional steps to help communities with comparatively high recent cases, as was done earlier with um, Washington and Orange County? Uh, I'll let Dr. Levine. Uh, comment first, and then possibly Secretary Smith. So you're referring to the uh, the most recent cases that in the last 48 hours, correct? Yeah, 20, 20 cases today in today's report for Orleans County, which is a, a fifth of the day's total across the state. Yes. So, the, you know the way contact tracing and case investigation work is those numbers come in overnight and so today we will actually have more light on what those cases mean and if they do relate to an outbreak or to situations as we call them uh, within the county so I'll have to reserve judgment on that because that's what today will be all about is gathering that information but we'll know by the end of the day for the majority of those cases since our contact tracing workforce is pretty up to date on those initial case uh, interviews. Um, and I guess before Secretary Smith may jump in, um, uh, uh, while I have you, Dr. Levine, I was curious about the texting initiative. Um, uh, is there going to be any provisions for verifying identities and numbers before that gets, uh, before those numbers are texted, or is there a risk that? Uh, people may inadvertently receive a, a wrong number text, if you will, and uh, how quickly um, will people get the phone call following the text? Good. So, so Secretary Smith can weigh in on that as well, because uh, the reason we haven't released it as of today is we're going through those final checks and balances and making sure that uh, from a personal protection standpoint and legal standpoint, everything is uh, set before we actually make it operational. Um, I'll let him uh, add to that, though. The, the phone call would come usually within the same day, so it wouldn't be um, you know, days later. This is just a very early, quick mechanism to connect with the person, get them familiar with our website, get them familiar with what they need to do about quarantine. Yeah, thank you for the question. There is a verification process that's in place. Now, could there be a, a, a situation where a text uh, definitely went to the wrong person because of a change of phone or somebody's phone is in the hands of somebody else? That's a possibility. But we're putting all the precautions in place to make sure that doesn't happen as we uh, move forward on this. We need to get the technology out there, I believe, in, in making sure that we contact people as quickly as possible and get them to quarantine. I think the likelihood of the scenario that you talked about, given the safeguards that we put in, is very low. But at the same time, I'm not, I'm not going to discount it as a non-possibility out there. But as, but as I said, we put various safeguards in there to make sure uh, through a verification process that that doesn't happen. In terms of meeting with the community, Dr. Levine and myself are very happy to meet with the communities of any county where we're seeing 
um, some situations where we need uh, local involvement to get the word out. We did that with or Orange and Washington counties. We'd be more than happy as soon as we can get uh, the contact tracers and some information on Orleans and Essex County as well. You may, you may also have noticed that Essex County has, has been increasing in its positivity rate, um, primarily because of its proximity to uh, the New Hampshire border, which is also having its problems in northern New Hampshire. So on both of those, I, I think we, A, we put the technology in place and put the safeguards in place, but B, uh, we'll meet in Orleans and Essex depending on what the outcome is from the contact tracers. Okay, thank you for that. And, and uh, one quick follow-up on the texting initiative. The sourcing of those phone numbers, that's literally just the, the person who's a uh, positive is sharing their uh, contact list from their cell phone. I mean, they're, they're, they're submitting the phone numbers for the contact tracers. That's correct. They are they are submitting, or we will find it through a different uh, a different way. And sorry, just okay. Dr. Levine or, or Secretary Smith, maybe you could clarify: Is that what the process is currently when you're getting the contacts from a positive case for the contact tracing process? Exactly. All right. We will move to Aaron at VT Digger. Um, can you hear me? Can. Um, NBC is reporting that several states are having issues uh, from the federal government side with IT and coordinating the delivery of the vaccine. Has Vermont experienced any of those problems? Um, being that it hasn't even been approved yet, um, we haven't experienced any of those problems at this point. Uh, Commissioner Sherling or Secretary Smith, is there anything you've heard from on your side that would give you uh, give you pause? Governor, this is, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I'll I'll, uh, I'll do a brief one and hand it over to the Secretary, Mike Sherling. Um, the uh, vaccine depot that's been set up in Vermont did an end to end exercise with the federal government, uh, checking on the ability to order and virtually receive and distribute the vaccine, and that went well. Um, no reports uh, have come in through the SDOC of, of issues that we're aware of. I turn it to Secretary Smith. Uh, I'm going to basically uh, say the same thing that. Uh, Mike Sher uh, Commissioner Sherling has said, um, you know, we're building a lot of stuff as we go go along here to be in compliance with uh, reporting requirements from the CDC and other uh, federal government requirements. But so far, I have not heard of any sort of hiccups along the way in terms of uh, our IT uh, gateways, I guess uh, we'll call them. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm curious, with the long-term care facilities, um, you, you mentioned that the state is providing help with uh, getting them access to testing. What about access to other things like PPE and uh, staffing to uh, fill gaps in, in staffing needs? Uh, Secretary Smith? Sure. Um, a couple of things. We're making sure through um, the SEOC that uh, they do have the required uh, PPE that they need. As you know, we built up our PPE inventory uh, during the times when we had a low case counts, and now we're using it in those long-term care facilities. So we have PPE to supply to those long-term care facilities if they need it. And any time that they've asked for it, we have delivered those PPE. By the way, the, um, the rapid response teams will often ask those questions to the long-term care facilities when they have an outbreak in their, in their facility. What types of things do they need and how can we help? In terms of staffing, there's several things that we do. One is that the commissioner of the Department of uh, Aging and Independent Living, uh, Monica Hutt, spends a lot of time on the phone making sure they have the appropriate staffing and talking with other people 
um, whether it's UVMMC or other facilities to make sure that staffing, that their staffing needs are met. There is a period in time, and Dr. Levine has mentioned this, about 24 to 48 hours when um, a facility first has its outbreak that the staffing needs are most, uh, most compromised, and that is um, one of the ways that um, Monica Hutt, the commissioner, Commissioner Hutt has been working with them to get staffing in there. There's also, um, we're also developing, and probably announce it next week, we're also developing a pool of uh, reserve staffing to come into long-term ca uh, care facilities that will be on standby uh, for these situations uh, if they arise in the future. So we'll have that pool as well because there's two areas as I said the 24 to 48 hours and then in an outbreak where they are seeing death in their in their um, facility that those last hours um, do take a lot of staffing in their facility so we're gonna we're gonna do that and uh, hopefully we'll help with those long-term care facilities and their staffing needs Okay, and, and those, those uh, that school for nurse staff, would that be, you know, nurses, like qualified nurses? I know they would. The general they would. lack of shortage of nurses in the state. Yeah, they would be a combination of nursing, uh, nurses, uh, both RNs and um, other types of nurses, plus uh, uh, licensed uh, nursing assistants. So they would be a combination of those to depending on what the facility would need. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, and uh, just texting back with Rebecca here. Um, one, it's Mike Sterling. One additional uh, layer of detail to add around PPE and uh, long-term care facilities. Um, what happens is if they have uh, an issue with their supply line, uh, they're able to order a 14-day supply through the medical countermeasures warehouse. Uh, that 14-day supply is based on the amount that they have in stock at the time they make the order and their projected burn rate. And then taking into consideration to potentially add to the stock that's sent to them in that 14 days is whether they have both COVID positive staff or residents uh, active at that point. So that assessment's made and then the shipment's done. Is the, are the number of outbreaks occurring in long-term care facilities affecting like our overall burn rate in the state? Uh, I would say they are affecting the burn rate because the, the more cases you have, the, the more uh, the, the larger uh, that burn rate becomes. But the stability of the stock is remaining uh, stable. So we haven't seen decreases uh, in the state, but I should be clear, in the, in the state's emergency countermeasure stock at this stage. Okay, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, perhaps you've seen that report about the Vermont State Colleges. And um, without getting uh, into the weeds too much, one of the recommendations was that you need to be more uh, assertive in, in keeping these uh, colleges afloat, the whole system afloat. They're, they're talking about insolvency, as you well know. And the, one of the other uh, big recommendations is um, consolidating the administration, not shuttering the college, the campus, the poor campus. So, but having one administration uh, overseeing all of it to save some money. And I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on that. Um, as far as me uh, personally getting more uh, assertive, I don't think there has been anyone else who's been more assertive than I have over the last four years in uh, trying to promote uh, more dollars to our state colleges. So um, I've already done that. Uh, in terms of uh, the future, um, we are in a, a bit of a holding pattern, as you know. Uh, we don't know what the stimulus is going to look like. Our, our coffers aren't exactly full here in Vermont. We're going to have to make a lot of decisions about uh, what uh, between want and need. And uh, if the legislature uh, and myself uh, agree uh, in terms of providing more resources to our state colleges, um, it's going to have to come from somewhere. It's not a uh, endless supply of, uh, of dollars here in Vermont, and we're going to have to make some very, very tough decisions. So 
if we uh, if we invest in one area, it has to come out of another area. Uh, so there isn't just this uh, magical stockpile of money uh, that we have available. Uh, I will say again, a lot of this is predicated on what Washington does in terms of stimulus and so forth. Um, so that's the, the, the great unknown. Uh, we know what we have coming in. We don't know what will be provided and what the terms will be. So again, uh, we'll get into this. Uh, this is something the legislature has an interest in, we have an interest in, and uh, we'll try and work the details out uh, over the next uh, couple of months. But uh, I'm not here uh, prepared to talk about what I'm going to do or what we're going to do or what the legislature is going to do because I don't think anyone knows really at this point. I am continuing to look for uh, a plan uh, from the state colleges uh, that was part of the agreement uh, as we uh, when we uh, provided uh, the, the 20 I think additional uh, 22 million dollars uh, to them that they have a plan for the future uh, in terms of becoming more solvent. So. I look forward to that plan. I know they're probably still working on it, and uh, we'll we'll work uh, work through that uh, in debate with the legislature. So, just to, just for clarity, you don't have an opinion right now on whether to consolidate the administration. So. No, no. I think uh, that's all suggestions by this group uh, this, uh, that was formed, and um, I know the legislature again has an interest in this. We have an interest in this. And we'll uh, we'll have that uh, that debate over the next uh, couple of months. Great, thanks, Liam VPR. Hi, um, I just wanted to follow up on some of the questions that have been about uh, staffing at these long-term care facilities and. I know uh, Secretary Smith was just talking about a plan to create a pool for, you know, helping staffing out at facilities that might have an outbreak. But I'm kind of curious about immediately right now um, if the state is concerned about staffing levels at any of these facilities experiencing outbreaks. I mean, Elderwood at Burlington has 66 new more cases from last week. Um, St. Albans Health and Rehab has 22 more, Berlin Health has 16 more, and I imagine that a number of those are among staff members. So is the, is the state concerned about staffing levels in any of those places? And if so, uh, what's being done about that? Yeah, we're always, uh, Liam, we're always concerned about staffing. We were concerned about staffing issues long before the pandemic. Uh, we had a shortage of workers here in the state of Vermont, so that's ongoing. And, uh, and it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. So we, uh, we've had some challenges early on. Uh, if you remember, Burlington Health and Rehab had a, a situation. Uh, we were fortunate. Uh, the UVM Medical Center uh, came to our aid in a short period of time, stepped up uh, to help uh, in, this, uh, in this time of need. So we're looking at all avenues and trying to provide uh, for the long-term care facilities and uh, taking, uh, taking care of the most vulnerable and we'll continue to do so and, and this reserve uh, capacity is something that we want to uh, to, to put to, together uh, so that we have resources uh, when needed but secretary smith do you want to, uh, to add more to that sure there is a need uh, for staffing as the governor has said and we continually to monitor uh, those needs I think Commissioner Hutt was on the phone most of the night of Thanksgiving and continues to be on the phone uh, just about every night, just making sure that there's staff. There has been um, uh, there has been communications with the University of Vermont Medical Center to help out in some of the staffing needs uh, at uh, Elderwood as well as some other places that have come to the aid of Elderwood as well. Um, as, you, as you've noted, when we have a outbreak in those facilities, it, stress, it, it stretches and stresses staff in those facilities. And we spend, um, the commissioner spends uh, most of the day making sure that those facilities are well staffed. And that's what she's doing today as well with Elderwood. And so, um, can you can you tell me, you know, how 
how many folks are being sent to help out at Elder Wood. It sounds like that is the one that is experiencing the, the worst, and just from the numbers, is it's experiencing the worst situation right now. Yeah, I don't have those numbers, but I will get those numbers for you. Okay, thank you. And I'm all set. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Joe, Barton Chronicle. Joe? Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, here I am. Hey, Joe, you're going to have to start over. We didn't get any of that. Uh, on Friday, I asked Secretary Smith um, about where things stand with um, getting um, Health care of back up running uh, or up and running in places like Orleans County. Um, he said he didn't know at the time, but he get back to me. I'm wondering whether he knows more now. Yeah, I think we got part of that, Joe. Uh, Secretary Smith, do you know? Yeah, I think, Joe, and if I get this wrong, let me know. Um, I think you mentioned hubs, uh, child care hubs, uh, last time we had talked and I said I would follow up on that, which I have. The child care hubs, as you remember, we, we stood up in, in, in like a few weeks uh, a, a major number of child care hubs and we stood them up based upon the need at the time on who was going to be remote and who was going to be uh, in in classrooms, those remote obviously got priority during those times. As we said in the beginning, we used coronavirus relief funds in order to do that. Those funds are running out at the end of uh, this month. Um, and so we're going to have to look at um, a different mechanism, I think, for the, uh, the area that you talked about. Uh, primarily because we don't have the funding for that and actually we're in the midst of uh, shutting down those hubs given the fact that they were, um, they're, they're, the time that they were useful has since passed. Now with that said, we do have capacity in our regular child care program and it's matching that capacity with your needs up there and we're looking at that right now, Joe. Thank you. Um, I had a question, I guess, for Dr. Bodine, and the question is, um, at what point um, will you begin to have a sense that the vaccine is actually working once you begin to uh, administer it um, in the community? A very challenging question, John. So, Everyone agrees that we need to achieve what's called herd immunity or community immunity, which is somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the population being vaccinated. Uh, since we don't have such a high percent of the population who already have seen the virus and been ill from it, or not even ill from it, uh, but contacted with it. So that's not going to happen probably till most ambitious and optimistic program would be late spring um, to see that level in the community. I will say one thing though, um, and this is important, uh, and there's been a lot written on this recently. People talk about the vaccine preventing people from getting ill, which is what it's designed to do, but then they also talk about the vaccine being designed to prevent transmission of virus from one person to another. And not so clearly worked out yet if that's going to be impacted by having a vaccine. When you get a shot for a vaccine, it causes your body to produce antibodies to the, uh, in this case, the viral antigen, the uh, spike protein. That's in your bloodstream. So once the vaccine enters through your nasal passages usually uh, and other mucous membranes, uh, once it's getting into your bloodstream, it's going to be counteracted by those antibodies. 
What is not less clear is how about at the level of the nose itself? So will the virus still be able to replicate itself and get to higher levels in people's nasal mucosa? Uh, and they will still be capable of transmitting it to others, even though they will fight it off in their bloodstream. We don't know that answer right now. So what's being recommended is that everybody continue to do all the things we do, with the masking and the physical distancing and avoiding crowds, et cetera, so that that kind of transmission can't occur during this period of time when more and more people are getting vaccinated. But one thing that Vermonters should be hopeful of, you know, I believe we still may be the best state with regard to the numbers of cases and percent positivity. We're certainly in that top group if we're not the best. And uh, if we can continue as we're going and even better and suppress the level of virus in our communities to levels like we saw months and months ago, we will have a quicker response from vaccinating our population. And the population will achieve that immunity quicker. And I guess the end result that it would translate to would be returning to a more of a semblance of normality within the state of Vermont quicker than in other places. So I just hold that out to you as a possibility uh, if we can really keep getting a handle on things here, get people to take the vaccine at, at the rates that we expect. Um, we'll see where we are in the uh, early or late spring. Thank you very much. Lisa, you have the Waterbury Roundabout. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Levine, that was a great lead in to the questions that I wanted to ask um, about kind of the, the practical um, rollout of the vaccine by in, in individuals. And that's, do you have a good handle yet on how long it will take from the time that someone gets a vaccine to when it's actually starting to be effective for that individual? Um, and I've seen some reporting about how there's uh, some expectation of side effects. I don't know if that's with all of the vaccines or just certain versions of it. Um, are you expecting there to be many people that will be displaying side effects of that and what that might look like, especially if the healthcare workers are some of the first people getting it? Um, will it look like they're getting COVID when they may just be reacting to the vaccine? Okay, thank you for those questions. So. First of all, um, when people get the vaccine, the side effects that are being reported tend to be fatigue, maybe a transient low-grade fever, uh, injection site uh, discomfort, things of that sort, not necessarily the whole constellation of symptoms that characterize what we now call COVID-19. So, uh, I would not expect people to have any kind of prolonged symptoms that might make them think they're coming down with COVID itself. But they may have these other milder symptoms that will still be noticeable to them, hopefully for only a 24-hour period. The uh, rate of, and, and we only know this really for the, the, the one vaccine, the Pfizer one. Uh, so it's going to be you know, potentially different for every vaccine. And we're just going to have to learn that data and uh, understand it better. But the rate of uh, significant reactions is very far below 1%, perhaps low, lower than 0.5%. And that kind of stuff we'll, we'll know more about after the uh, panel reviews it and potentially authorizes its use. So there's that part of your question. Um, the first dose. Uh, the interval between the first dose and the second dose is going to vary by the vaccine. It could be two weeks, it could be 21 days, it could be a month. Um, and that's going to be you know, vaccine dependent. But if we accept the thesis that we discussed earlier in the press conference that you really need the second dose to achieve that level of effectiveness that everybody would want to have, that's going to be a minimum of four weeks and four weeks is probably generous. It's probably going to be more like uh, six to 12 weeks before we would really want people to feel confident that they've gotten both doses 
and they're getting the immune response in their body that we would want them to have to fight off this infection. So that's why we're telling people that, you know, this whole business of having to um, wear your masks and do everything else is going to continue during the time we're vaccinating people. And it's again, potentially because of that ability to transmit the virus through the nasal secretions, you know, through talking, coughing, et cetera, um, early on in the course, even though the person isn't going to get very ill from that uh, in the long term. And that's why if we can suppress the virus to very low levels in the state, there'll be less people that have to worry about the fact that they might have it in their nose because um, there won't be that much virus around. That's, that's a very helpful explanation. Um, one other question I'd like to ask is if there was any other update as far as testing and healthcare workers. I'd asked about that a couple of weeks ago and I've gotten a bunch of messages from people from both Central Vermont Hospital and UVM Medical Center that they're concerned about the fact that they aren't being tested unless they have symptoms. Since we're so close to the vaccine at this point, is the plan to just go full steam ahead with vaccinating healthcare workers rather than trying to roll out a testing program for them? No, these, these two things would go in parallel. Uh, I'd hate to say we have so much faith in the vaccine and in having enough vaccine over a rapid period of time that we would abandon any other strategy. So testing of healthcare workers is important. I, I want to just make a point about that, though. When we talk about testing healthcare workers, yes, it is to protect the public and protect the facilities. But frankly, that's not really the problem. Because as you know, we're, or if you don't know, we're not having abundant cases in healthcare facilities transmitted to people uh, who are patients of those facilities or, or visiting as outpatients. We may have a staff member here, a staff member there. Um, most of those people in hospital settings, unless they have a desk job administratively, are wearing uh, their N95 masks and other PPE. So. We're not as worried about transmission within the facility, even though this will, of course, help to have a testing strategy. But we're also equally concerned about having a important population of people who are like other Vermonters in most ways, except that they happen to work in healthcare. And so that will be a, a good surveillance strategy, uh, much like we're doing uh, in correctional facilities with teachers, et cetera. Uh, so that's why um, we will do those hand in hand, the vaccination strategy and the testing strategy. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your answer. All right, we're closing in on one o'clock and we still have three folks left in the queue. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, Governor Sununu in New Hampshire wants to help the troubled hospitality industry there by cutting the rooms and meals tax, which is now 9%, same as Vermont's. Would you recommend our legislature reduce the rooms and meals tax to first not lose business to New Hampshire and also to help our own struggling restaurants and hotels? Yeah, I think we're taking a different uh, different approach here. Uh, we We have committed uh, a good deal of money, millions and millions of dollars uh, to our um, struggling businesses, those in hospitality. I talked about it earlier in the press conference uh, and will continue to do so. So when we receive money, uh, we know uh, that there's a dire need uh, and they uh, uh, and some of them are on uh, the brinks of, uh, of bankruptcy. So we will continue uh, to do what we can with uh, that uh, those dollars. I don't think uh, in, in one sense, eliminating the um, rooms and meals isn't going to help them specifically, I don't believe, uh, unless, I, I don't even know what the strategy is of Governor Sununu's, uh, whether he's just allowing them to keep uh, the rooms and meals tax, is that what he's doing? I believe he's reducing it. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not really sure how that helps the restaurateurs in particular. Okay, thank you. Um, also, could you please, or, or the commissioner, please explain the thinking behind prioritizing vaccination of at-risk healthcare providers over the at-risk healthcare recipients, such as nursing home residents? 
I think we're, they're all in one grouping, and we're hoping that we can uh, help both. I, I understood the commissioner to say that the uh, this week, the, the first batch anyway, would all go to health care providers. Was I mistaken in that one? Yeah, no, I think it's split 50-50, Guy. Thank you. Uh, also, the text number 86911, uh, 86 is police radio code for fatality, and 911 is the emergency number. Is there a, a subliminal or maybe not so sub subliminal message in selecting these numbers for the, for the text? I have no idea. Yeah. Well, well someone well, has to come up with it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll look into that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Steve, NEKTV? Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great, um, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I had a question for uh, Mike Sherling and uh, one for the good doctor, if I may. Uh, uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, we had a, 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 a shootout here uh, up in Newport last week, um, and uh, I know people who witnessed it personally, and uh, I guess one of the statements from these gentlemen uh, who, who were involved in the shootout said they, they, they came to Vermont to make some money. Uh, I'm not sure if it was like roofing, siding, maybe post-foliage tours, uh, but where uh, where is the, the the drug task force uh, in stuff like this? Uh, if, if we could monitor cell phone data uh, for for people entering the state and whatnot, uh, can't we monitor like uh, repeat visitors or you know people who cross the border frequently? Or uh, uh, is the drug task force working um, with? with you know, uh, other folks and uh, uh, enforcement agencies in, say, Connecticut, where these guys were from, or Massachusetts? Uh, let me take them in reverse order. Uh, the Drug Task Force, uh, in conjunction with the DEA, local and county law enforcement are in constant communication with law enforcement organizations around New England and beyond on complex drug investigations. Regarding tracking people crossing the border, I think it's important for listeners to note that uh, uh, the tracking that's done or the, the statistics we're able to provide about cross-border travel relative to the pandemic are not based on individual identifying information. They're aggregated data about just general uh, cross-border traffic. You would need some kind of um, court order in order to track individuals. Yeah, I, I, but uh, I, I'm sure these folks, to, you know, didn't adhere to our uh, to our quarantine stuff. And if they're like known bad actors or have have you know prior records, uh, wouldn't that enable us to uh, maybe get uh, get such uh, court orders or warrants to uh, to maybe uh, follow some of these uh, fine folks? I'm not familiar with this case specifically, uh, but the threshold for uh, a, a court order or search warrant to get that kind of information is facts and circumstances that lead a reasonable and prudent person to believe a crime has been committed and that evidence of that crime will be found in the place to be searched. So um, there's a pretty high bar that you have to make a direct nexus to the tracking uh, being evidence of the crime. It's a fairly robust legal standard. I also believe, uh, Steve, I, I believe that has to be volunteered. You, you can't, they can't just take your data, cell phone data. You have to volunteer to be part of that program. I believe that's what Commissioner Pichak has told us. Yeah, so it's mostly after the fact. They have to commit a crime first in order to get the, uh, to get the warrant to, to, to do anything. Uh, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to work here. Okay, and for the doctor, again, with this uh, PCR thing, I've had a, a multitude of uh, information headed my way from uh, different folks, 
Um, and uh, it, it seems to be the law of exponentials here. And um, I guess uh, from what I uh, understand, uh, you know, if you use a PCR cycle of 40, it equals a trillion, where if you use a well, one of 20, it equals a million. And, uh, and there's no infectious virus found in any samples over 30 with lab cultures. And uh, even Dr. Fauci said that uh, anything over 30 is meaningless. And uh, every single study in journal states uh, that the PCR method, because uh, it's not really a test, uh, doesn't ID infectious virus that only a lab culture does. You mentioned that you were meeting with the CDC folks. Um, is, uh, were you <coughs> discussing like some kind of standards so that, uh, I, I mean, uh, that, that maybe the, a cycle threshold of, of, of 30 be adopted as a standard so that we're not like, you know, again, uh, we're catching minnows and, and uh, detecting them as whales? Yeah, th these, are, these are all good questions and they do beg some standardization, don't they? Uh, which doesn't really exist right now. Um, I don't think Dr. Fauci cut it off at 30. I think it was in the low to mid 30s. Um, but still, you're, what you're asking is, should there be a cutoff limit? And the answer is probably yes. And it's probably because the pandemic has been evolving rapidly that that has not happened. Um, the whole issue, for those who are wondering what we're talking about, is just trying to determine if someone who tests positive is actually testing positive because they have infectious virus in their secretions. And um, that would mean a lot more than if they just had fragments of virus that actually weren't going to harm anybody, including themselves, or they were a residual of a previous infection or just a very sensitive test. So um, we don't really have the answers to that because we don't use cultures for anybody. Uh, that's a pretty cumbersome and time consuming and expensive process. Um, and that's why we have to use the test that we have. Uh, so until that's resolved, which will be much more resolved in the scientific world, um, I don't have a good firm answer. But I do think it is something the CDC should be thinking about more. And we can, it's not something we've uh, been meeting with them on. We have enough, enough other issues. But I could certainly raise that as one of them. Do, do we know, do we know um, how many cycles uh, are being currently used by the different labs that the state is contracting with? So we don't know all of them. Um, because there are so many of them. And each one of the labs has multiple platforms. So they, they won't just have one test that they can give you the cycle threshold, there'll be multiple. So there is a whole spectrum. Um, I, I will say though, that this, this has uh, kept us in good stead because we've been identified, you know, let's say we're over identifying uh, as, as the risk that we were taking, um, it's not really hindered our ability to manage the pandemic <clears throat> and to appropriately isolate and quarantine and make sure that Vermonters are safe. Uh, I'd feel much worse if it was on the opposite end where we weren't actually detecting enough and perhaps people were uh, more susceptible because of that. So. Uh, I'd rather, rather err on this side than the other side, but I do agree with you that more standardization in the field at large would be helpful. Rebecca's indicating to me that we need to finish our final questioner so we can end the press conference, but thanks for your question. All right, All right well, uh, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to Avery at WCAX. Hi, Governor Scott. Uh, Congress does not it's no money comes from Congress or very little um, for a stimulus plan or bill. What does Vermont plan to do? Is there been discussions about cutting programs? Well, again, you know, we're right in the middle of our fiscal year. We just passed uh, the bill back in September. So we have the resources to get through uh, to, uh, to the end of June of, uh, of 21. 
So we're not in dire straits at this point in time. We do have reserves uh, and, and capacity there that we have not touched. Uh, so there are other mechanisms that we can move forward with. But if you're speaking about 22, um, I'll be presenting a budget uh, to uh, the legislature in January, uh, that uh, in later January, uh, that uh, that will uh, deal with what we have right now, uh, whatever it is, whether we have the stimulus package or we don't, uh, we'll provide a balanced budget uh, to the legislature for their consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll see you on Friday. Thank you.